Mango. Video games, the ultimate form of entertainment. From the early experiments of the 1950s, like Tennis for Two, to the highly sophisticated three-dimensional epics of today, the video game has become one of the most pivotal parts of modern pop culture. After Space War, Computer Space, and Pong, the video arcade became the ultimate escape from reality. By 1980, the video game business was in full force, with many companies trying to produce the best in electronic entertainment. Today, I'm going to tell you the story of one of the most influential figures in gaming at the time. His name is Rick Dyer. Rick Dyer's love for creating new ideas began at the age of two, when he started making games and toys for himself. One of the first electronic inventions I did was um, I built a, a talking cuckoo clock for my mother for her birthday. and. Uh, it looked like a regular cuckoo clock. You had to pull the weights on it and so forth. But on the hour, it would, instead of cuckooing, it would tell you the time in the day. And on the half hour, it would tell you the time and give you a quote from a famous philosopher. By college, Rick was signed with the entertainment company Hughes. He was their first engineer to be hired without a degree. And in 1979, opened his own company, Advanced Microcomputer Systems. It was here that Dyer was able to begin work on an incredible idea, to create the most realistic electronic world imaginable. As the creativity flowed, Dyer invented an interactive medieval game with numerous adventures. The images and options for the player would be shown on a reel of cash register paper built into the game's interface. The computer would, like, kind of like a, a player piano, it would, it would roll the paper forward at a high speed and then stop, and you'd see a picture and some writing, and it would give you a list of choices. He called it an interactive book. But the publishers and, and manufacturers said, the public's not going to see it that way. We're never going to be able to sell it. So this, this was just one of those things that, that now collects dust. In 1982, Dyer went to the theater to see a movie, The Secret of Nim. Enter Don Bluth, a former Disney animator who formed his own company in the late 70s, director of films like The Land Before Time, Anastasia, and An American Tale. We put the, the film in the theaters, The Secret of Nim, and it had a so-so response, and I figured out last summer that everybody was watching E.T. So, and if they weren't watching E.T., they were in the arcades playing games. And there was a, at that time, uh, there was a young man who came to us and he says, our company called Advanced Microcomputers would like to do an arcade laser disc game. With Bluth now on board, Dyer began work on a new arcade game based on the Dragon's Lair segment of his film strip game. After the CED failed to work in early tests, the medium of choice was switched to Laserdisc. And that player enables you to take a 30-minute roll of film, put it on a disc, and you can cut from any one scene or frame to another almost instantaneously. Rick's team would send script after script to Don, while simultaneously figuring out the electronics of the game. The game's computer would tell the Laserdisc player what to show and when to show it. It's like a phonograph record that you can just simply spot it at any place you want on the disc. So it's called random access when they get into the, you know, the jargon of the engineers. The game was finished and released in 1983. It was a massive hit. <laughs> These kids at the Celebrity Sports Center here in Denver are playing the newest rage in arcade games, Dragon's Lair. You've seen how different this game looks from the average video game. Oh, 
zero to $30 million in orders in, in uh, the first 40 days. It's incredible. Soon other companies started joining the Laserdisc craze. Every gaming company in the world wanted to create the next Dragon Slayer. From Sega to Bandai and Namco to Capcom. Games like Astron Belt, Cliffhanger, and Badlands. In late 1983, Dyer and Bluth began work on their next game, this time with Bluth writing the scripts and Dyer creating the gameplay, as well as serving as producer. The second one is Space Ace, and it is a game that's a little more complicated. It's a game in which we're going to be able to take several paths as we go through any adventure. This is an animation challenge, so our background men are painting backgrounds very much the way they would do if we were making a classical animation feature. Now Dyer is ready with Space Ace. The scripts and storyboard are done locally. The animation is by former Disney artist Don Bluth. Space Ace has one sequence that could be symbolic in Dyer going head to head with Atari. The giant is shown destroying himself in pursuit of the smarter and quicker hero. I think right now the arcade industry is playing catch up to us. We have a sense of direction here, which is, uh, I'm not sure that, that some, of, some of the companies like Atari have that anymore. In 1985, Dyer began developing what would be a new home video game console, with an AI boasted to be comparable to HAL 9000. A room full of people talking to computers, and computers talking back to people. This is RDI, the company that gave us Dragon Slayer, Space Ace, and now Halcyon. 25,000 units are the sales estimate for the first year. Only one or two units are in selected video stores now, just one in San Diego County. Good evening, Hal. What do you want, Rick? Halcyon will have an optional conversational computer control. It takes remote control out of your hands and into your mouth. The game that comes with this is Thayer's Quest. You've seen stories on that before. The new twist will be a disc for a football game. For the first time for the players that, that have always been watching football and saying, gosh darn it, why didn't they do that. Why didn't they throw a pass? Well, well, you're going to literally get to be the armchair quarterback and make the plays for the for your favorite team. Because what I'm talking about isn't isn't uh, the future. It's here. It's today. What we're really doing is combining art with science. My wife and I, as you probably can guess, are gambling everything we own on this. So it's it's kind of scary, but. It, that's the sort of thing that makes you want to succeed. The cost of the computer, $1,800. $1,100 if you own a laser disc. A price like that was simply unacceptable in the 80s. It even appeared that the Halcyon wasn't as sophisticated as advertised. While doing a demonstration on live TV, the system malfunctioned in a very severe way. Let's go to the forest clearing. One. Word. One. Speak consistently, Stuart. One. Sir. Two. Two. Dyer was losing money. 
he was forced to halt production on the Halcyon. The test markets failed, and the Halcyon was never released. Dyer took a break from the world of gaming, and in the late 80s turned his attention to necessity. Utilizing the AI from the Halcyon, Dyer created the Power Size Machine, a new interactive piece of exercise equipment. Just like the Halcyon, the computer would learn about the user over time. What I decided to do uh, as an outgrowth of, of Halcyon was to, to create an interactive piece of fitness equipment. And the reason is I saw a market out there, the, the, the club industry, uh, that was a parallel to the coin-op. In it, and it was very backwards in technology. So what I did was essentially took a trainer and put it into the equipment. The, tra the equipment talked to you, it knew who you were, it interacted with you, it set the weight, it did everything that a personal trainer was, only they were robots. It was sold to Living Well Fitness Corporation for a hefty sum. Using the money from the deal, Dyer was able to return to gaming. His next project would be even more advanced than any other. I just got into it immediately. I was here when they were first putting it in, and I was like one of the first people to play it. And I just was hooked on it ever since. When I first saw it, I, I kind of looked at it, and I couldn't believe it. People touched it, and they pulled their hands away. It was really it was incredible. It was neat. It blew us away. We had no idea it was going to turn out this great. It's called Time Traveler, and what makes it unique is that it's not animated. The characters are holograms. San Diego actors played the parts and became holograms in the game. It went into arcades this summer and quickly became the third highest grossing arcade game in the country. It pulls in a million dollars a week. This is the first project I've ever worked on, and I mean it in my whole life, where going into it I said, this is a winner. Well, it wasn't actually holographic, but it did have a dome mirror built into the cabinet which would reflect images from a monitor playing off a laser disc. What makes this game so unique, not just for kids, but adults too, is the unusual format. Dyer has been able to shrink his lead characters, real people I might add, down to about five inches in height. They appear real in every way, except when you try to touch them. I'm a man with a mission, a boy with a gun. I got a picture in my pocket of the lucky one Who doesn't know I'm a big mess I mean a really big mess A big, big mess He was all mixed up in a big mess Big mess He was a He was really mixed up He was a big mess Big mess He was a He was really mixed up I'm a man with a mission a boy with a gun I got a picture in my pocket of a lucky woman Who doesn't know I'm a big mess I mean a really big mess A big, big mess It was all mixed up in a Sweet. In 1996, Dyer released his final game Kingdom 2, Shadowland. Since Thayer's quest wasn't totally finished, Dyer created the second part of the story and released it on PC, along with a remake of the original. Sadly, it failed to get much attention, and Dyer left the gaming industry forever. Today, Dyer spends his life semi-reserved, he works as a realtor in California, and occasionally, though rarely, appears at gaming conventions. Though Bluth mentions Dyer in interviews, he doesn't give him as much credit as he deserves. Because of this, it's a common misconception that Bluth created the game on his own, and has caused Dyer's legacy to be buried. Dyer is a very smart, creative, and brilliant man. I personally feel he deserves more recognition than he gets. After all, he did invent a style of gameplay that is still used today. The quick time event may be considered kind of crude as far as gameplay goes, but its influence is undeniable. I just hope this documentary will shine some light on his work, and though we will probably never see another game from Dyer, 
we can at least hope that his genius is remembered for years to come. The game industry is about to mature into an art form comparable to, to movies or, or to paintings and things like that. What I'm going to do is to create a world that is so real that you will have a hard time telling what's real and what isn't.